The window's ticking down, it's Friday, there's two, three hours left. You're about to commit a huge amount of money, tens of millions, occasionally recklessly, right? None of it makes sense. More often than not, it is reckless and there's some things you can't account for. Even for those of us who live the transfer window out professionally, our understanding of what goes on in the club war rooms um, is really minimal. I was with an owner a couple of weeks ago and he said to me, if you can do one thing, please try and uptick the way fans around the world understand how transfers really work. And I said, man, I am not Fabrizio Romano. That is a little bit above my pay grade. But I did want to take a moment to cast some light on what it's like on the inside. And in that regard, it is a bloody joy to welcome back to the Men and Blazers Media Network a great friend of the show, a remarkable human being, a 37-year-old who I admire so bloody greatly. He's made an incredible leap into the unknown, an audacious adventure as a football executive that's been a bit like a journey to an enchanted forest from MLS player to the front offices of the English Premier League. My guest was CEO at that sleeping giant of English football, Nottingham Forest, whom he helped return to the Premier League promised land. He was there until January of this year, and it's a joy to welcome the greatest Dane since Kierkegaard. Oh, live from London, it's the one and only Mr. Dane Murphy. Raj, great to be back. Thanks for having me. Dane, how are we doing? Tell us quickly, catch us up on everything that you've been knee-deep in since the days of Forest Wonder. I know that you are a busy man. I know you moved to London. I know from speaking to a lot of people in football that you're kind of everywhere. You've been consulting for a slew of clubs, but, but just catch us up on the Dane Murphy reality. Honestly, if we take it uh, all the way back, this is probably the first break I've had from work since I uh, finished college. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's been interesting. It, at times it feels really nice and there's relief, but there's always that itch um, that you need to scratch to get back into things. And I've been able to bridge the gap by just doing as much research as meeting as many people and investigating kind of the ownership groups and investor groups around the UK and Europe um, as to what their ideas are in the future, how they want to grow clubs, how they want to invest how they want to build their sporting structures. And in the meantime, I, uh, a few of them that um, I've been speaking to, uh, I, I signed on as a consultant and have been helping them with yeah, infrastructure, investment strategies, uh, sporting ventures, both you know in the market, the player market, and also looking at other clubs to build you know, the, the very popular MCO model. Um, so keeping myself busy, also trying to find some time to reflect, get away, uh, gather myself before the next push because it, it'll, I'll get back into the, the game and get back into the, the office and probably not stop for, for a while. God, I always hoped that you would end up at US soccer. I always hoped for that headline. Um, but I got to know you when you were part of a Nottingham Forest campaign in which, let's just say, there were a lot of bodies coming in. I think the last week of August, 1st of September last year, four players came in and then Sergio Rie, um on loan. First of all, a club like Forest, middleweight in spending power, spending ability, you know, competing for elite pool of players, scarce elite pool of players. What's the secret in the approach? How do you compete with lesser funds uh, amid growth tailwinds? Yeah, I think the important part when you are coming out of the championship specifically and even if you have a club with the history and the stature of not enforced like you said a sleeping giant but you have lesser funds because you've been in the lower leagues for 20 some odd years you have to be more malleable more creative bring a bit of ingenuity to the table um, and find players that maybe yes some clubs are looking at but others aren't in the way of value meaning using data and eyes on evaluation to figure out who are the best players for Nottingham Force in that moment coming out of the championship that are going to allow the team to compete in the Premier League, hopefully stay up, which the team was able to do last year, and develop overall value for those players for future trading markets. And that's kind of the macro headlines of it, but it, it's far more nuanced and detailed than that when 
when all of a sudden you, you win the championship playoff final and you're thrust into this new world of, hey, we have to compete in the best league in the world in less than a month. And we have to completely overhaul our squad and the inner workings of our you know, transfer strategy. By the way, anyone who's listening who is in that predicament that Dane has just articulated there, um, call me. I've got Neil Mope for $100 million. He can solve all <laughs> of your problems. But I know that you learned your trade at the knee of the great Billy Bean at Barnsley. And you mentioned data. Give us a glimpse into the algorithm. When you talk about data, what, what specifics are unique to the that you want to give away? Because I know it's all proprietary, but no one's listening to this, Dane. Hmm. What, what, what's a data point that would surprise us that you're looking at that can provide boost in squad planning? Yeah, I think that's actually a great question because Barnsley is the perfect example. Uh, my first foray into the European UK market was um, with Barnsley stepping up from League One into the championship. We had a strategy in place when I arrived. It hadn't been executed yet, um, but we sold our three most successful players for the season before for value and then added 12 to be able to make the team a little bit younger, probably a little less valuable up front, but with a season of championship under their belt. Um, the ROI on, on players that we brought in would be significantly more than than what we had uh, moved out of the building. And learning the ins and outs of how to approach that, having Billy um, be you know the mastermind on the data side and allow us to say, hey, what are the players that you see in the data that's going to marry into the way our team is playing and the core philosophy of the on-field tactical approach? Uh, at the same time, using the limited resources at Barnsley, to be frank, uh, to marry the two together and to make it work and to stay in the division, build value uh, with Billy and his team of analysts. Basically, it was always about getting the team younger, making sure um, that the players could compete at the level, knowing that uh, the coach wanted to bring them in and was going to utilize them because you didn't want dead weight coming into the team. And knowing that if the, if certain players played over a period of time, that the data would win out and the eyes on evaluation would win out so that success was had in staying in the division and then over the short to medium term moving up the table to, like we did in the second season, approach the championship playoffs. So when you're talking about what Billy was looking for, was he just looking for large guys who could just get on base? <laughs> no, it's his... Um, his data across different sports is always different, right? So baseball is one thing, football is another. It's his own IP. He doesn't allow anyone to get into. No one's listening. You know the inner workings, yeah, like you said. He mind. So not even yeah. I, not even I or anyone at um, Barnsley knows exactly what the formula was. But we were able to see what the output was and how it made sense, and then evaluate them ourselves, either through video or seeing the players, you know, speaking to uh, their coaches or their teammates building a profile around them and Billy always found the players and his group especially at Barnes they always found the players didn't matter what size they were didn't matter how fast or slow they were that were going to give us the most predicted goals and the least predicted goals against um, and it was as simple as that and we were able to myself not having much data impact um, before getting into Barnsley and Forrest and understanding the nuance of it basically saying okay i think from my evaluation from a from an eyes on human error standpoint um these players would work in the championship in this system but again you know i was kind of thrust into the atlantic ocean without a life preserver i had i had worked in the mls never been in english football <laughs> and you had to lean heavily on those who were using the data and also had knowledge of of the league and what worked so well, when you are so data-driven, does that take some of the emotion out of the window? It, it's never personal. It's just the numbers talking. Well, that's the, the best part about it is it's, yeah, it's, it takes the, the, the personalities and the emotion, puts them on the back burner. And it, the most important thing it does is it takes risk out of your decisions uh, because you're cutting fat immediately by saying, these are the guys who are to the top of the heap in our evaluation process using data and then we can take the second step, which is here's our eyes on valuation, look at the video, do a profile, uh, deep dive with the people surrounding them, and set a list of, hey, here are the center backs, the uh, wing backs, and the central mids. 
here's our list one through seven. What does the staff think? Um, what do the, the coaches think? What do the analysts think? And then at the end, the decision makers, uh, it's a club driven model, you know, with, with, with Barnsley and at Forest, make the final decision and what players will be bought and sold. So Premier League GMs who are listening to this, just to cut to the quick, Dane told me before this, computing all the numbers the best defender on the market is Michael Keane and again call me if you're interested but here's what I want to know about transfer deadline day take take me in the last day the window's ticking down it's Friday there's two three hours left you still know what the club needs the, the holes that need to fill the clock's ticking down to the wire the desperation kicking in at the same time you're about to commit a huge amount of money, tens of millions, occasionally recklessly, right? Like last minute pivots, like with, with, without 100% confidence. Can you, can you describe that emotion in the war room as the clock's ticking? Definitely. Uh, there's, there's one day in the year that's worse than the last day of the summer window. That's the last day of the winter window. None of it makes sense. Uh, I would say more... <laughs> Often than not, it is reckless, and there's some things you can't account for, right? You know, take tonight, for example, EFL Cup, someone gets injured, one of your main players that you bring on in the 75th minute to stretch out a result, he gets injured, out for the season, now you're scrambling, and on Friday, you're overpaying. And the last day is tough. I will be very surprised if a club like Brighton is is swimming around and doing a lot of things on the last day, just because of the preparation and um, the evaluation process built into the systems at a club like Brighton, but not everyone has that process and the, the, that core philosophy and, and those systems in place. So it becomes a bit manic, a bit of a freestyle, and you see money flowing in and out that honestly sometimes doesn't make sense. I don't like the last day. It's, it's as an operator, it can become um, volatile. It's tough on the emotions. It makes you feel alive, if I'm being honest. You know, you get out of it and you're exhausted, but you think that was exhilarating. But at the end <laughs> of the day, you look back on it when you re-evaluate the time that you spent on that last day and what happened. Generally, you're not that happy, especially if you're spending a lot of money on that last day. I want to dig into that. And by the way, you mentioned Brighton. Fabrizio Romano, our friend, reporting that Brighton are closing in on Ansu Fati from Barcelona. Um, a formal proposal received on loan agreed to um, by the player. But does it happen more than we think where a player really hasn't been on a club's radar, but in those last crazy few hours of the window, you know, an agent calls up, offers a client, and just suddenly everything's just surging towards Marouane Fellaini? <laughs> I wish that wasn't the case. I wish Fellaini days didn't happen, but it, it, it does. Things become so high-pressured, and there's so many chefs in the kitchen sometimes um you know uh, the managers the head coaches are feeling the pressure the owners are feeling the pressure those in the front office are you're trying to predict where you're going to end the season and if you think you have the ability to get into the top six or the top eight or the top 12 or you're trying to stay in the division your decision making can bounce off the walls um and can be very unpredictable and it's just not it's like big it's not the best way to approach it. yeah right and you sometimes have outside forces that throw the market into flux, like we've seen with Saudi Arabia. Every couple of years, some other market changes the values, it changes the timelines and the schedules. And this season, you see the depth charts are just completely um, gone and, and, and void because this new burgeoning league has overspent to bring in all of this talent and some of it older talent. And that may lead to a crazy day this Friday of English Cubs who had lists going into the summer. And because of what's going on in Saudi, those lists have shifted, changed, morphed into something that they didn't expect. As a major stakeholder in a negotiation, does it bother you when the media receives leaks of negotiations? Does it, does it make you paranoid? Or is this just part of the normal strategy, part of the dark arts of a negotiation? Personally, it doesn't. Um, I actually left the artist formerly known as Twitter when I was at Barnsley because I just couldn't I couldn't take it anymore and family <laughs> members and friends getting involved and you that's when you, you have to pull the plug on it um but I I'm, I'm not even exaggerating now while doing consultancy work I'll get you know three four five messages a day I would say 60 percent of the messages I get from agents other clubs um, other operators within the sport 
saying, hey, did you hear about this possible deal? And I said, no, I didn't. And then they'll send me a screenshot of Fabrizio or David Ornstein. And the, the power that these guys now wield and the leverage that clubs and agents use with them, it's very hard to discern what's real and what's not real. Now, Fabrizio usually and David usually get, you know, tip top information. Um, and they're good enough and smart enough to weed out, hey, am I being used here or not? But I personally don't let it affect me in work. But the problem is the rest of the market does when it's owners and um, agents, uh, coaches, even at times, managers, you have to be able to, you know, move with those punches. How much does a Fabrizio tweet affect the market reality? If it's an interested party in a player or multiple parties and you know, take, for example, player X at Brighton um, is being looked at by Chelsea and Liverpool. And Chelsea's been and Brighton have been, you know, at loggerheads going back and forth. And then Fabrizio tweets out something about Liverpool that can completely flip the negotiation process. He could either speed it up or call a halt to it. So it holds a lot of weight and it can actually change things in a flash. I think those who are veterans in the market who understand how things um, are going to flow in and out in, in, with information online can sort of see where the pitfalls are, but there are others who I know can get tracked into it. It's it's difficult because you know it's it's part of the, it's such a major part of the window now, and it does have a a space that allows people to judge what's going on. When the window's over, do you take a minute to celebrate? Do you, do you have a glass? So I guess in the great footballing tradition, do you have a pint of white wine, Big Sam star with your staff? Does it feel like a euphoria? Or the second it ends, is it like, oh crap, I've just, it's like a massive mortgage you've taken on and the stress kicks in immediately? I don't think I've had a celebratory window since I've been over here. Not to say that they haven't gone well or gone bad or been indifferent, <laughs> but it's always... The clock strikes midnight, and you're either still trying to file paperwork uh, into the FA, into the Premier League, and hoping that you know the players and the agents and the other clubs got everything on time. And so it's not midnight; it's midnight thirty or one a.m. And then you just fall out of your chair and slink your way back to your car and go home. And the next day is really the okay. Let's let's evaluate what what was achieved where we fell short, what could have been better, how we could have prepared better. You know, you see after the NFL draft or the NBA draft, guys standing up in their suits and slapping hands and hugging each other. Hasn't happened for me, so I'm, I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> By the way, celebratory window, that concept, the celebratory window and the Fellaini days, it sounds like a, <laughs> a, a, a rare B-side Dave Matthews Band album, uh, which is yet to be released, but I do adore it. What was your most chaotic transfer? Is the one that stands out? I don't think there's any one individual that stands out above the rest. You know, you have you have stories about dealing with agents and trying to get their fees in line and deal with clubs. I honestly think the most chaotic period was that first summer with Barnsley, where show up, okay, we need to add we need to add value because we're going to add. Uh, depth into the team so let's go sell Ethan Pinnock Kiefer Moore Liam Lindsay get the most money we possibly can from Brentford and uh, Stoke and then turn that around and use that money nothing more to bring in 12 players and when you're coming from the MLS where it's a different language the league has built the contracts and you're filling in the blanks to the wild wild west of the UK EFL Premier League market and you're trying to keep your head above water so you know you sell your three best players there's people beating at your door with pitchforks and and um, Molotov cocktails then you have to deal with a bunch of agents you don't know and try to right the ship with your coach to make sure his, your manager to make sure he's on side <laughs> with the decisions that are being made and manage upwards I swear the first month and a half I was there I thought I'm not going to be long for this. I will be back in Reading, Connecticut in three months, and I'll just have a bunch of Yorkshire men and women who hate my name and <laughs> my time there, and that's it. Oh, it is time to go to oh, the questions from you, our favorite part of the show, the part where we get to speak with you, dear listeners, and answer 
Oh, your questions, Dane. Stay as long as you can and want, and you know how it works. Request to call in. We'll move you to the stage. Stay unmuted till we shout you out. But let's dive in, starting with at 722 Strikers. Are you there, mate? If you are, tell us where you are and what's your question. Hey, Raj. It's Amy, Man City fan from Brooklyn, calling from Paris. A few days ago, my sons and I were watching City play Sheffield United at Bramall Lane in the away fan section. You weren't kidding about the stale beer and cigarettes. <laughs> anyway, a Spurs friend just texted me this afternoon that Chelsea signed Cole Palmer. It's sad to see such a bright young player leave the team. So my first question is, should City have tried to keep him? And two, how do you think he'll slot in at Chelsea? Ooh. Cheers. Uh, Amy, you are an incredible human being. I hope you make memories with your kids in every regard. Dane, I don't know if you've got insight into this because it is fascinating. Cole Palmer, to a large degree, is uh, seen as a, you know, an ebullion asset. But Pep Guardiola at the same time uh, was very, very clear 10 days ago that there would be no loans for this young talent. This would be a sale. Like, he was very, very clear this was a one-way ticket out, which surprised a lot of people in key moments through pre-season, um, in key moments in competition. This is a gentleman that has delivered with a swagger. And while Pochettino was also very clear that he was looking for a mobile uh, attacker who could play across the front line, and this is a gentleman that seems to fit that reality as well as uh, the new kind of burly law of a young, rough prospect with huge upsell possibility. Why would a club like Manchester City let such a raw, clearly potential-filled uh, gentleman go? Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm, this one surprises me. First of all, the, the price. I think it's a great price for Chelsea, and Chelsea continue to add young talent and attackers. I don't know how they're going to fit everyone on the field at once. Um, the only thing I can think on City side is they saw what they have now currently with Foden, Grealish, Doku, Bernardo, Silva. Um, that means Silva's not leaving because Mars has gone out the door. They thought if they got the value that they wanted for, for Cole that they would let him go. I think he's a massive talent um, and when given the opportunity will show that this was a bargain deal for Chelsea. Can I ask you, how do you watch football now, Dane? Is it possible for you to watch football as a fan? Or are you still watching the Cole Palmers of the world as, 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 you know, as potential stocks, as potential assets? Yeah, it's a sad part of, of the reality now is that the fandom has, has gone out the door. It's <laughs> tough. It's, it's, very, it's very hard to watch any match and feel emotion towards it in the way that I used to. Now it's much more analytical and there's a lot more evaluation behind it. You're always trying to find you know, the next great edge, whether it's a, a player or a group of players or a, a tactical approach. So sadly, it's too much breakdown when I watch games now and not enough love of the, love of the game oh, anymore. Another question via our email. Benny from Spring Lake, New Jersey wants to know, when you look at the Premier League teams and this transfer window, who's had the low-key best transfer window this year? Not just splashing the cast, but doing so with a smart strategy. I've got the feeling you've already answered this partially with your Brighton hint. Yeah, if you take Brighton out of the equation, um, I think Burnley, in terms of value, bringing in young players trying not to overspend, have done a good job in the market. It'll all depend on whether they stay up at the end of the season, right? They look like geniuses or not. That's, that's the sad part of the game. I think Tottenham has done a good job. Um, I don't know what the next few days will look like for them. They, you know, Fabrizio's tweeting things left, right, and center about them, but I think they've done a pretty good job. And that would probably be my answer. It's always, now it's the cliche thing to say Brighton, but again, they've shown that their preparation um, and their approach is, is unrivaled. Well, what is it about that? I've got to say, in my darkest days as an Everton fan, a team of chaos, a team of confusion, a team of just, I mean, it's been a long you know, eight years of money spent equivalent to putting it in a garbage can and setting it on fire. I look at Brighton soaring at this same time with sage, calm, strategy preparation methodical preparation sequencing through where who can be sold and when like a calm planful approach to football why is 
that approach, the rarity, why do Brighton and Brentford stand out so singularly? Why are other clubs, I mean, football is a very copycat realm. Why do they still stand out and other teams, that gap has not been closed? What do they have that makes them so rare? I think in its simplest form, because it's, it's difficult to have the amount of patience that they've had and sticking to a true north and having a lane that you know you may have to deviate from at times, but you're always going to return to that lane. You're going to stick to your core principles in recruitment. You're always going to have a backup plan for your talent on the field when they leave. Here comes the next swath of players that we have already um, built out through our data process and our evaluation process. There are not a lot of chefs in the Brighton kitchen with a lot of opinions. It's very much, here's the system. If Dan leaves and goes to Newcastle, if Graham Potter leaves and his staff go to uh, Chelsea and our recruitment staff goes to Chelsea and other places, we know the next people in line that are going to replace them. It's simple in idea and in form, but very hard in execution. One more question before we close. It's from our YouTube comments where we're live. Check out our YouTube page, GFOP, subscribe. Poppy04 says, Dane, how heated can transfer negotiations come? Be honest, is it is it at all in the Jerry Maguire realm? Just agents screaming. You know, I'd love it if you were like in Barnsley shouting at one time or another, show me the money in your American accent. That must have actually been quite a, a successful moment of negotiation. I would imagine Jerry Maguire's yet to come out in Barnsley. It's still a forthcoming attraction. People were like, that guy, he's a genius. Um, but is it, uh, Dane, you would have been a very good Tom Cruise, by the way, in a, in a different life. But is it more buttoned up? Is it more professional? Is it more just WhatsApp numbers being sent forward and backwards? Is it more professional than we imagine, more clinical? It's professional at times. There are definitely times where it gets ugly. And I had to learn that the hard way. I'm, I'm an Irish Catholic from, from the Northeast and have a bit of a temper, so to speak, <laughs> at times. And I've had to keep that in check because honestly, sometimes with agents, it can get really tenuous. Um, and I don't see eye to eye with them sometimes. But yes, it can be very Jerry Maguire like. I have not been smart enough or smooth enough to pull out the show me the money line though. Can you give us an example without naming names? A time when you regret that part of your wonderful heritage and you just let something slip out. <laughs> yeah, probably the one that would get me in the least amount of trouble. We were selling a player and I became so upset with this agent that I had never met before. Honestly, I'd never spoken to him. And he got on the phone and spoke to me at first like we were best friends. And then the second call... <laughs> He acted like he was my father, and I, I banned him from the ground. I'm not proud of it, but I, I took that step. And in, in the end, it was actually the right decision, but I probably could have you know, gotten some couples therapy first. Last question for you before I let you go. I would not be doing my duty to the Premier League owner that begged me this. What is that? You, you have lived transfer windows. You have been on the end of the phone. You've been in those WhatsApp groups. You've thrived. You've signed. You've failed to sign. Um, what is the one thing that we as fans do not understand um, about the last night of the transfer window? What's the biggest misnomer that we have that you need to tell us? Like, what do we, where, what is our biggest blind spot? I think that even if you have um, a plan in place and you think you can execute something in the last few days, there is going to be chaos on the last day because some will feel that they can leverage you or someone will feel left out in the, the process with the player or um, someone from the staff would actually like to do a little bit more or get a different player. So they don't really understand the chemistry and balance of how much is going on behind the scenes. I know fans are always upset at when things don't occur that they think are going to occur in the last 48 hours, but the amount of juggling and speaking and getting everyone to buy into the philosophy is not easy. Oh, God. So it's not as easy as us just tweeting, um, announce Benzema 
uh, announce Mbappe. Yeah. That doesn't. Uh, right. That's not how it's done. That in its own right, right is so bloody enlightening. And I want to, just before we go announce that the day that Fellaini appeared at Everton, like a little baby giraffe with his shorn hair when he arrived, still one of the greatest days of my life. One of the greatest <laughs> transfer window moments of my of my adult being. Dane Murphy, you are a beautiful human being, one of the smartest, most strategic human beings I know. Oh, when you're next back in Connecticut, come and have a drink with me. Greatest child of Reading since Otis. Dane, it's amazing to be with you. Listen to the full version of this podcast and all our podcasts wherever you get your pods. But first, subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. Go, go, go.